Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Radically Love Podcast. I'm joined by a very special guest today. Carmen Rita Wong is here. (laughs) (laughs) This is amazing. I'm so when I got your um like your bio and your book, why didn't you tell me? I was like, okay, how do we get Carmen on the show. I have so many questions. I obviously, as a fellow Latina, I'm like, let's have this conversation. Now's the time. The time is now. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to talk to you. So you have a book called Why Didn't You Tell Me? (laughs) Can you just give us a little background on the title? What does it mean? Tell us. Uh, Full title, Why Didn't You Tell Me a Memoir? Um, yeah, it's my fifth book, but it's it's my first, of course, memoir. Um, hardcover, I did the audiobook. There are pictures inside the book. Listen, how, Why Didn't You Tell Me is a question I'm asking kind of like my mother's ghost in a way. You know, I'm having a conversation with her. Um, each chapter is headed by kind of like a because, you know, in her answer, yeah. like because the stage was set, because white is right, because, you know... And it, it just helped me to get into her head, which is what I was trying to do. Yeah. Big family secret about my origins, which we'll make it into, um, and my origin story. And a lot has unfolded over the past 20 years. And I wanted to get to understand my mother because to understand her is to understand the very typical immigrant story, Latina story, how you know, that generation and how previous generations thought, how they, you know, the countries they came from and really having a different relationship with my mother than I had when she was alive mm-hmm. by getting to understand her and seeing her as a full human being. Um, it was easier to have empathy for her. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, how difficult um, she had been in life, but yeah, to get at that. And you know what, Rosie, listen, it was to get another one of our books on the shelves. Okay. Because when I was that little kid in the library, the library was my sanctuary and I happily finished a book and I'm sitting in the stacks and I, I'm 11 years old and I'm looking around, reading the spines and I'm realizing, where, where are we? Where am I? Why aren't we there? And that had to change. So I'm hoping that my story as a very typical, frankly, American story will open more doors for more more of our stories. They have to be out there. Yeah. And I mean, look, you in your career, I mean, you really have made us proud with the representation and just you have had such a wonderfully celebrated career. You have many accolades. There's been a lot of features. And I just, I think it's really important, especially that part. I, I'm curious for you, after writing other books, like this one is something that is so vulnerable and something so close to your heart to be able to share your origin story and the relationship with you and your mom. Like how, what was it like writing this for you? <laughs> Ouch. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it was really <laughs> Um, it would, it, you know, it really was my magnum opus. It is probably the greatest professional thing that mm-hmm. I have done. I've done a lot, including hosting my own TV show, but this is uh, my top three on the money. Just kidding. Uh, Just yeah. Kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also being vice chair of the Planned Parenthood Federation and all the, those are my top three things in this book, right? Because this is a legacy for me. Um, and I'll tell you why it's one of my greatest works. It is 50 years of work on myself, the culture changing, right? Um, And really being at my best in every single 
way. So writing the book was, you know, some people have asked, you know, is it cathartic? Is it healing? Yeah. You know what it was? It was clarifying, very clarifying, not just because of my relationship with my mother and other people, my family, but Rosie, once you realize, and this is what the book forced me to do, I had to look back very much in detail. And I wrote, this book is maybe only 200 pages. I wrote like a thousand pages. So I really went back there. I did a lot of writing. Um, but what I really realized is we, you know, when do we stop being creations of our parents and society's pressures? Mm. And when do we start being our first self, right? Because we are very programmed, especially, you know, with immigrant parents, it's, you must achieve, you must be working, you must be moving forward. Like we, we are relentless in our pursuits, right? I looked back and I was like, wait a second, who am I if I'm not doing? Mm. I'm not doing what I've been programmed to do. And if I'm not doing what society tells me I need to do, you know, I used to think, you know, you can't achieve yourself out of your skin in a racist country, right? So that was the other thing. There's all these influences on us. And writing this book really made clear to me that it's time to get back to my OG self. Who am I if all of that falls away? Yeah. Oh God, Carmen, that is deep. <laughs> you know, I'm so curious too, just as a, a working professional, how how is the culture of the Latina in the workplace changed now in 2022? I would say what, like 20 years ago, you know? <laughs> 10 years ago even. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious. Like what what how how has it changed? Well, from the beginning, you know, I write in the book about how my first job at Christie's auction house on Park Avenue, their original address. I mean, talk about what an environment, you know, global British art auction house. I changed their their um dress code. They had women were not allowed to wear pants. And that's in, you know, the 90s. That's really insane. Um, and you know me, I mean, look, we look pressed and dressed and good at all times, especially in the workplace. And I made the argument that I look better than some people wearing skirts. I'm more professional for clients than some people wearing skirts. So why would you, anyway, that was my first form of rebellion there. Um, but things have changed quite a bit. You know, when I had my show, I had to fight to wear hoops they were deemed too ethnic. Uh, yes, yes. And I was rocking my cat eye, which I've been doing since, which I didn't do today, but I've been doing for since I was 16 years old. I had to fight for that. You know, I had to straighten my hair. I had to, all of that. Uh, so much has changed. Even in the past five years, like the crown act, to be able to wear your hair natural, to see, you know, there's a discussion now, of course, about the chola look and how it's being appropriated and all this yeah. stuff. Look, we are the original influencers. We, to the ability to be able to, to work and be yourself and proud of your community and how you show up is an incredible advantage. And I love seeing it happen. You've seen the data, my friends. Americans today, more than ever, are paying attention to their health and overall well-being. It has especially become a priority for those who are working hard and playing hard well into their 40s and 50s and beyond. This is more than just a trend. The recalibration of thinking is causing people to be more conscious about what they consume and how their actions impact their environment. Enter Remedy Plus. Remedy Plus is a premium line of natural plant-based nutritional supplements, topicals, and snacks. Each product is uniquely formulated to help adults address specific performance challenges they face during different points of their daily routine. Now, my approach to health has always been one of a holistic standpoint. I've always wanted to optimize my health and my well-being, trying to just be the best version of myself and my health as I possibly can. And, you know, I've looked for products that I could use that I can incorporate into my daily routine that I feel really help me achieve the level of performance that I can and also help me focus throughout the day. 
and I can use Remedy Plus Rub on my knees after a long run. I can take some of the caps if I'm needing a little bit more help in my recovery, and I can do one of the shots if I'm needing to focus on my work, like right before I record a podcast. Remedy Plus is the singular name in plant-based performance. It's designed to help people punch above their weight and below their age. So make your health a priority. Head over to MyRemedyProducts.com and use the code ROSIE20 so you can save 20% off of everything available on their site. Go to MyRemedyProducts.com and use the promo code ROSIE20 to save 20% off of everything available on their site. Yeah, I mean, I think back, I, I used to manage a hair salon back in the day yeah, in the middle mid early 2000s it was like my first real job and you know I was like a 21 year old kid managing like 40 plus celebrity hairstylists in Ooh. West Hollywood right Whoa. so that was like I was in that and oh God, excuse me Oh, you have no idea. I'm like, we could stay on after this and I'm happy to share all the stories. But yeah, I remember in the beginning, like you show up ready, you show up as you are and, you know, it being sort of not the look of the time, right? It's like, maybe can you dress it down a bit or, you know, just maybe like not the cat eye. I'm like, I love that you're talking about the cat eye. It's like, (laughs) I think initially too, you know, I, I've had this experience at different, different times in my career, especially even entering the world of yoga and meditation. I mean, come on, you know, like the experience that you had going into the library and looking at those spines, I had the same reaction when I got into the world of meditation and mindfulness. Like there was no, there wasn't any teachers that looked like me at all. You know, I was like, where are my people? Like, where are, and I grew up and I'm in LA, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles, you know, and I think that for me, it was the same incentive where I'm like, how can I bring this practice to people like the people that I grew up with, you know, like, how do I expand this more and bring more of my people into a world that is going to be helpful for them, for their state of, of being right. So I I love that you're saying that and you can call that out. I think it's really important for us to be able to recognize like the leaps and bounds that we've made even, yeah, even just thinking 20 years is not that long. It's really not that long ago. It sounds intense, (laughs) but I mean, but I mean, if you think about it respectively, like my show was only 2008, 2009. I'm fighting to wear hoops. Yeah. Are you kidding? They're being called ethnic. Yeah, but I'm not surprised, you know? Look, and now, you know, a lot of things is like everything goes. So even in the past, I say in the past five years, especially in the past two years, we have seen tremendous change. Yeah. Thank God. If you can show up to work yourself, that is the energy that you can put to your work that is less of a cost emotionally, mentally. Physically, to have to constantly dull yourself or to put on a performance, which I had to do a lot of my career, which is can be, you realize later, painful. It's exhausting. Yeah. Just just want to show up as you. Yeah. And I and I love that you're talking about that because obviously it relates to our identity. And I do want to get into some of the topics in your book. And You found out later in your life that the man who you thought was your biological father wasn't. Um, Can you talk a bit more about what that was like and how that affected your sense of identity? Ah, yes. Well, I um, got the role of the dice in life where I had the Dominican Afro-Latina, you know, of African descent mother and Chinese father. And we lived in Harlem initially. Then they split up. She married Anglo-American. We moved to New Hampshire, which is like, that's how she used to say it. There, <laughs> there were none of us. New Hampshire. There were none of us there. None of us, right? Um, we were pulled away from our family, language, culture, food. It was all about assimilation. It was all about erasure. Um, and finding out though, 
that biologically, and this was 20 years ago, I find out that biologically, Poppy, Poppy Wong, as I call him, um, wasn't my father, was so devastating. You know, I tried to do it justice in the book as to understanding like how, you know, how do you stop being that person? What I've realized, even though the, the whole mystery, by the way, was only solved last summer doing edits of the book. Wow. So the epilogue is, is you know, the most recent um, mystery solved, but it really allowed me to think as I wrote this book and understand because Poppy passed away uh, in the summer, for this, this summer, he, he was my father. So am I biologically Chinese? No. But am I a Wong? Yes. I will always be a Wong. There's race, there's culture. As we see in Latinaness, right? Mm -hmm. We come in all races. So there is no limitation there. And the same thing applies in my life. My nieces are Wongs. My brother was a Wong. You know, my daughter, six, she's in Mandarin six. You know, like this is part of our lives. That biological tie was, was sad in some ways, but in, the, in, the, in other ways, I don't know how much it changed. Yeah. You know, it hurt to have it disappear, but guess what? I still was taking those late night calls from Poppy saying, Kami, what are you doing? You know, I still, I still, I still had to, you know, get him into hospice and I still had to bury him and intern him actually. Sorry. He's of course Buddhist. So we had a Buddhist ceremony. That is what family is. Family yeah. shows up. Yeah. So he, I think that was, that's such a, a beautiful lesson in, in, especially in your book, right? It's like we, it, it's, it's what some people say. It's like your chosen family, you know, and sometimes the people in your life that you choose to be closest to are not your blood, you know, and that doesn't change your devotion, loyalty, and love for them. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious to ask you this because it's something that I was thinking about as I was reading, like, we have this idea of this, you know, family, this, what is it called? The, the sort of visual, the white picket fence, the... Oh, yeah. American dream type of family. Yeah. Uh, nu nuclear family. Nuclear family. With, uh, with the white picket fence. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like, and growing up in the States, you know, growing up in the US, like we have that messaging throughout our entire lives. It's in show, it's in TV shows, it's in wow. media, it's in it, imaging and marketing. But to me, I'm like, that's not uh, growing up in a Hispanic household, you know, I have a different, that family doesn't look, that family doesn't react how my, I mean, like the people that I'm that, around do not yeah. do that. Right. No. And, and that's what my mother was chasing. She was chasing what she was told was the American dream. She marries an Anglo-American. He builds her a house. She learns how to drive a car. You know, she, you know, that sort of, what it is was tragedy. It's tragedy to come from a culture that values community and interdependence. And yes, we can also be independent in that. We can also have boundaries. We can, we can do these things. It's a dance, but we can do these things. But to do that and to go into a culture, that white picket fence and that house, it is so isolating. We were so isolated. It isolates you from your community, it isolates you from, from you know, your people. And maybe this is not the case if you're able to continue having that in your life. But for me, that's what it did. Um, and it isolated my mother from her family mm -hmm. very much. So, so there's a, there was a big, big, big price we paid for that for sure. Yeah. I mean, it definitely brings a lot of reckoning right to the surface. There is a lot to unlearn. There's a lot to process. So I think how, how long does that process take? Is it something that you in a way work through or is this something that's just like a part of your life that you have to sort of like unravel at times? And then it's like, I think about it like a gold chain that's been tangled up, right? Oh, you kind of yeah, start. Yeah. So, so what is that? What is it like for you? 
So I'll take that metaphor and I'll run with it. So, you know, you know what my little pincers are, you know, the little pincers you use to tease it apart. 15 years of weekly therapy. (laughs) That's that's take that metaphor and run. You know, how much easier is it to do with the pincers than it is with your fingers, right? Once you can really get at it. So that's what um, I've been doing and working on myself. And, and it's one of those things, you know, my therapist always reminds me like, he has tons of clients and yes, it's a, he, and yes, he's, he's an old man. He's like Obi-Wan Kenobi. I call him oh my God, I my Obi-Wan Kenobi, my, my Yoda. Um, <laughs> he, you know, he, he's a, he's an old hippie and a, and a piece of work. And I always thought I couldn't work with a white man, especially, but you never know where you're going to find your, you know, the people that help you. Um, and he says to me, you know, I have a lot of clients, but you do the work. You have to do the work yourself. The, when you go into therapy, they're not going to fix you. What they're going to do is they're going to lead you places, you know, that you're going to go and, and have you see things that maybe you haven't seen. And then you sit with it. And then you process it, right? And processing means looking at it. Yeah. You know, in 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 Buddhism, which you know, I'm sure is that when you when you look at the fear, it loses its power. When you look at what you're terrified of or what hurts you and you really look at it, it loses its power because then you see what it really is. Um, and that's what I've been doing. I've been trying because you know what? Those first, you know, whatever years, decades of my life, the way I, way I was working, it wasn't working for me. Rosie, it wasn't working for me. So I knew I had to do something different. <laughs> No, that's good. Yeah, I really do love the the power of being able to, I like to call it, it's like you're shining the light in the dark places, yes. right? You're bringing the darkness into the light. And I think for me, that's what drew me to learning about, yeah, all the different uh, contemplative practices like Buddhism or like yoga, the study of paradoxes where, you know, the, the practice of yoga as a philosophy is you're bringing the, what's dark into light. And I Mm -hmm. think that it's the same sentiment. So when you're able to really focus on those parts of you that need healing instead of running away from them, which is what most people do, they numb them away, they push them Mm -hmm. down, they act out, you know, it has to express itself in some way, shape or form. So um, I want to pivot a little bit (laughs) and ask you like a million questions, right? (laughs) Um, how I'm like, help us oh. with the world. You know, you are, um, you have a position at Planned Parenthood Federation of National Advice. I Advice. did. I yes. actually just finished six years, which is the max that you can do. Um, I just wrapped and it was incredible. Hello, friends. It is fall and my favorite time of year to be cooking. I am not a fan of cooking in the summertime personally. It's just I live in the valley in Los Angeles and it's really hot. And normally when it starts to get cooler, I love to spend time in the kitchen. It may also be time to ditch the chemicals with Caraway Homes, non-toxic cookware and bakeware collections so you can make healthier cooking a piece of cake. Get it? piece of cake. I've been a fan of Caraway Homes non-toxic kitchen wares for a long, long time. They're all designed for the modern home and they feature chemical-free ceramic coatings so your food can be prepared with the peace of mind that no hard-to-pronounce compound will leach into your delicious and healthy ingredients. Plus, all sets come equipped with easy access storage solutions so that no stacking is required. Gone are the days of misplacing your lids, which to me was worth it just for that reason. And Caraway's Cyber Season event is almost here. You can save up to 20% on all Caraway products, including their internet famous non-toxic cookware set, which I put on display whenever I want Tori to make me pancakes. I just put them on the counter and he knows what needs to happen. So to get your non-toxic kitchenware, visit carawayhome.com to take advantage of their cyber season event and score up to 20% off of your next purchase. This deal won't last long. So visit carawayhome.com to shop all their incredible products for 20% off of this holiday season. Visit carawayhome.com. I've actually not talked about what's happening. I I try to just 
the politics in me, everybody that listens to this podcast knows how I feel about it. I, you know, this, this podcast, this platform is for everyone. I always like to approach everything and everyone from a place of compassion and a seat at the table. But I think that, you know, for women specifically, this has been something that has for years and years and years. I mean, right now what's happening in Iran is it's oh. never happened ever yeah before. The women rising up, man. Yeah. Amazing. So so I guess my question to you is, you know, how are you feeling about the power that women have currently? And for those of us that may feel disempowered with laws changing, mm -hmm. um, what can we do to move forward and to do what we can? I have a 15 year old daughter. So this is topic is very pressing, uh, not just because of Planned Parenthood, but because of her, obviously. Um, look, I, you know, I never, I, I never thought we'd go backwards. I never thought because, you know, I, here's one thing about when you talk about politics, look, when you exist in a woman's body, a disabled body, a body of color, you, you have no choice. Because politics is going to come up, you're living it. You're living it. Yeah. So um, that's, you know, and sometimes you wish that you didn't have to. Of course, we wish we didn't have to. But here's what I'll say. The best things you can do, and of course, if there are people listening in states that are particularly under um, bans, I would say to not lose hope is to connect. That's how we can move things in the right direction again, is by connecting. The despair can send us into this, you know, lonely spiral and, and, and also a spiral where we just kind of accept what's happening. But you are not alone. We are not alone with our fears. And if you're not comfortable with advocating, what you can be comfortable with is just connecting talking about it, you know, with other people in your life, not, not being afraid to talk about it, but that connection, you know, coming from Planned Parenthood, it's like, look at what's happening in Iran. When we get together, we are completely unstoppable. Whether it's women, whether it's all people of color together, they could never stop us. And they know that, which is why they're doing this because we are a huge force in this country and in this world. So if you know that to your core, that connecting is its own little act of rebellion. And you just keep doing that and getting to know the women in the movement or even just getting talking about it with your friends, you know, the smallest level, your, um, you know, whether it's, I would say your church, hey, who knows, maybe hey, you go huh? to a, yeah. church, a progressive Unitarian, I don't know, you know, community center, whatever it is, you center, advocate, advocate, change the curriculum at your school, change, you know, start a political group at school, a women's rights group, reproductive rights group. That's more all encompassing of all genders, that sort of thing. Do that and bring allies into this because they, they Rosie, they couldn't do a thing if we all came together. We wouldn't be here. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You know, with all the work that you've done, you've written columns for Glamour, Latina, uh, Men's Health, and so on. I mean, good housekeeping, it goes on and on and on, uh, all of your work. And I'm, I'm curious, because I always find that inspirational women like yourself that are highly accomplished, there's always a thorough line of intention, the sort of resonance that goes behind everything that you do, like the intention. I'm curious for you, like, in a sense, what do you want your readers, the people that watch and consume your content, your words, what do you want them to leave with? Well, the memoir, I want you to feel seen. And in being seen, you are valued because that's what books have done for me. They haven't just opened worlds up. There have been books by Black women, Latino women, Asian women who have helped me feel seen. 
And that gave me the power to know that I can take up space and I can do things. In terms of my work in the past, you look at all the different things that I've done. You, first of all, you'll be like, you did what? You majored in what? You're good to go. <laughs> and then you did what? Here's what I have to say. And I hope you take from it. The process of your career can be the process of just finding yourself. You know, it, it, it doesn't have to be this stagnant process of, oh, I'm just going to do this and I'm stuck. You're never stuck. You really are not. There's always a way to change things for the better. Help get to know yourself with what don't I like about this job? What am I good at? And just take that from the next to the next. But I'll say this too. Please make sure that your career, I was raised with this whole thing about, you know, your career is your life yeah, yeah. and yeah. Your self-worth and everything. And boy, let me tell you, when I was first laid off at Money Magazine in the early 2000s, I thought I was going to have a mental breakdown. I thought I was like, I have done everything for this company for eight years. I have, you know, led the Latina group and the, this group and the, that group. I mean, let me tell you what ridiculousness. Now I look back at that and I'm like, you're ridiculous. But I, it took that to get me to understand that like, listen, these companies are not your family. Do not tie your self-worth up with these people because then, you know, in psychology, you call it intrinsic versus external, like internal, yeah. external locus of control. Where do you define yourself? Do you let other people tell you who you are and what you're capable of? Or do you understand? who you are and what you're capable of. So I swung that pendulum back. And within a year and a half, I had my own TV show. All this to say, don't piss me off. <laughs> <laughs> she is it not to be to trifled with. with. She is not to be <laughs> trifled with. Okay. That's but what you, that means. You know that. I have to do with the clap, you know, you know? Yes. I love it. I'll just snap, you know, it's like, know that. <laughs> Know that you exist outside of all of this, right? We work, we work to live and that's fine. If you love your work, even better, even yeah. better. But for those of us who came from families with, you know, our immigrant parents were like, no, you cannot be a writer. No, you cannot, you know, go, go to Hollywood. No, you cannot do this. No, you can. So you can only be a doctor, lawyer, or MBA. It took me this long, but I made it. Yeah. I mean, I don't really have anything else to say to that. <laughs> so uh, before I want to be respectful of your time, before I ask you the final question, yeah. where can people go for more information or to connect with you? Go to my website, which is just com. old fashioned website, but you can, there's a contact there. You can contact or DM. Of course you can DM me. My Insta is just Wong. That's my preferred place to be. Um, so you can find me there. I love hearing from readers, especially Latino readers. I love here. I've been hearing just such wonderful things and I'm just so, so happy. Listen, I don't listen to the other people who have anything not nice to say, which, you know, some people cannot handle my chapter. I really talk about the racism I experienced in New Hampshire. A, if you're angry at me instead of angry for me, you're on the wrong side. So I'm not going to listen to you, <laughs> but let me know what you think and tell your stories. I really want people to tell their stories. Yeah. I want my book to just be one of, of dozens and dozens and dozens because our story is the American story. Yeah. And I, I just, I love it so much and your writing is so amazing and prolific. I just, I I'm really, uh, just honored to know you and, and your story. It, you know, there's so much that came up for me in that process, even when you're writing about the racism, you know, and the different experiences that you had and, you know, you're so conditioned to just deal with it. Right. To just like move through it. Like it's just a yeah. run of the mill experience, you know? So yeah. yeah, it's a powerful read for those of you that are interested. It is, it really is a transformative story and one that I think everybody listening should read. Um, I want to ask you the final question and it yeah. pertains to this podcast and why I started the podcast. 
I wanted to create a place for people to go to, to get inspired, to feel seen, heard, and understood, and to just have a place where we all can join and we all believe that the universe works for us and not against us. And the final question for you Mm -hmm. is, how do you feel radically loved? Oh my goodness. You know, I carry my brother with me everywhere I go. My brother passed away um, and I write about him in the book. The book is dedicated to him. Um, He was my first champion, my biggest cheerleader, and he radically loved me. We could fight and 30 seconds later be like, what do you want for lunch? That is radically loved. And we accepted each other tremendously. So I carry that spirit with me very much in mothering my daughter, my friendships, my puppies, all of that stuff. Yeah. And I love that you named the podcast that because I wish everybody can be radically loved. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Carmen, thank you so much for all of the work that you do and for sharing your story. Very vulnerable, very heart-centered. And I'm, again, so grateful that you came to do this show. We hope that you come see us again. For everybody that's listening, if this is your first time, welcome. And if you enjoyed this podcast, this conversation, please feel free to share it with anyone who you think it would bring great value to. As always, uh, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for being here. And remember that you're radically loved. And we will be back next week. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved Podcast podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie, on Instagram at Rosie Acosta, and Twitter at Rosie Acosta. By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com.